This presentation is called Dissociated Alters as Dream Characters by Monistic Idealism. Before I begin, I want to thank Christian Idealism for helping to structure this presentation and for engaging in some helpful discussions. I'd also like to thank Pessimistic Idealism and Jacob Power as they also gave some very helpful insight. And I would also like to thank Bernardo Castrop who helped me to uh, create this presentation in the first place, who led me to think of this sort of idea, and um, his work has been very helpful for modern idealism. So let's begin. On the right of the slide here is Bernardo. Bernardo is perhaps the leading expert on contemporary idealism. He has excellent work that gives arguments for idealism and arguments against alternatives like physicalism. I highly recommend to anyone who is interested in contemporary idealism to subscribe to his YouTube channel and to read his various books and articles. Uh, Bernardo's idealism successfully dissolves fatal philosophical problems like the hard problem of consciousness. His version holds that uh, essentially what reality is is one conscious self that then leads to the creation of the universe within it that has other conscious minds and um, though this has many advantages, there are still some important questions, such as how and why does a single conscious subject create or break up into many individual conscious selves, like humans and animals, with individual personalities and egos? Bernardo does have an answer to this question, but uh, his answer is that the reason why this is happening, or at least how it's happening, <clears throat> is that there is this process of dissociation that is occurring. And he says that the, the subject has something like dissociative identity disorder. This answer is helpful, but admirably, Bernardo acknowledges this answer has some limitations. I think dreaming can help with these limitations and can provide insight into this question. But first I'll have to define some terms. A dissociated alter is an alternative personality or an identity of a host subject. Uh, Bernardo also says it's a discrete center of self-awareness. A dream character is a person within a dream, or an otherwise autonomous entity who is an inhabitant of a dream. Uh, Stephen LeBurge, he's a PhD from Stanford, he is the leading scientific expert when it comes to lucid dreaming. And he says that dreaming is perception unconstrained by sensory input. And that perception is dreaming constrained by sensory input. A more poetic way he's put this is that perceiving is dreaming true. And dreaming is perceiving free. The next term is hypnagogia. This is the transitional state of consciousness between wakefulness and sleep, which I will be getting into more details. To create is simply to bring something into existence. And lastly, a prototype is a first typical or preliminary model of something from which other forms are developed or copied. I bring this term up because Dr. Deidre Barrett, who is a psychologist who teaches at Harvard Medical School, wrote this paper called The Dream Character as Prototype for the Multiple Personality Alter. She writes, in addition to these general similarities between dreams and dissociative states, DID alters and dream characters share the further distinction of being the two most dramatic instances in which parts of the self are split off and fashioned into somewhat autonomous looking entities. The thesis of the present article is that this process occurs naturally in REM sleep and can also mutate and move out into the waking state in response to extreme early traumas. The claim here is not that dream characters are the only antecedents of DID alters, but that they are the strongest. It may seem that we are at risk of overstating the primacy of dream origins to make the point here. Clearly these dissociative processes for both cognition and personality compensation do go on quietly outside REM. However, the discrete, autonomous personification of these processes is normally a REM phenomena and it seems to take early trauma to disrupt this boundary. So this phenomenon of the self splitting off into parts that are autonomous entities is something that more so happens when we're dreaming. 
and it even appears that the origins of dissociation are in dreams. Uh, Bernardo notes that not many patients with DID have concomitant schizophrenia, so they don't have realistic visions. Uh, what he's getting at is that a person with DID does not experience their alters the way you and I experience each other. They don't see their alter as another person appearing before them, like when you visit a friend. Unless a DID patient has an additional disorder that generates hallucinations, the times that alters are actually seen in dream, they are in dreams. Uh, Bernardo cites this study by Dr. Barrett, in which 57% of the DID patients that were surveyed reported they did experience their alter, but as a dream character. So I think the implication of this is that if alters are primarily experienced within a dream, and we are currently experiencing alters, then it is more plausible that the fundamental mind is dreaming. And what we call alters are actually dream characters. Remember, as noted before, this phenomenon of the self splitting off into parts, which are these autonomous entities, is something that does happen more when we dream. So it seems simpler and more plausible that the fundamental mind is having a dream with characters, rather than attributing something additional and less frequently occurring, like DID. Uh, Dr. Delena Van Hoyten is a psychologist who researches sleep and dissociation extensively, and she wrote this paper that shows a bit more on how there can be this reduction of dissociative phenomena to dream phenomena in uh, dreams and dissociation, commonalities as a basis for future research and clinical innovations. With her colleague, uh, Dr. Stephen J. Lynn, they write, we suggest that such dreamlike experiences infiltrate waking consciousness to create an experience of unreality that is expressed as dissociative experiences and symptoms. Dreamlike phenomena, which are ordinarily confined to sleep, thus intrude into waking consciousness and are expressed as dissociative symptoms, including depersonalization and derealization, and in the extreme case, identity fragmentation evident in DID. So, it appears that what we're calling a dissociated alter can be identified as a dream character, invading the waking state. Other work she has done seems to provide evidence of this. She notes that sleep experiences precede dissociative symptoms, that sleep loss can induce dissociative symptoms, and that normalizing sleep reduces dissociative symptoms. So it appears that sleep and dream phenomena are fundamental to dissociation, and we may even be able to say that we can reduce dissociative phenomenon to dream phenomenon. So how are these other conscious selves created? Well, I have a model for this, and here would be the order of that creation. It starts, similar to how Bernardo does, with a fundamental mind. Then there is a loosening of the ego boundaries of the fundamental mind. This fundamental mind then enters the hypnagogic state. This hypnagogic state has creativity to form the dream world, and conscious subjects then fragment from the fundamental mind and inhabit the dream world. So I'll start with the fundamental mind. This is essentially a conjunction of priority monism and idealism. Essentially, a single subject is what's fundamental to reality, with metaphysical explanation dangling downward from the one. So, to make this a bit more clear, there is a single whole subject. And though there are parts to the subject, the whole is prior to its parts. Initially, there is no division, there's no parts that make up this subject. There is just one whole subject, but with the loosening of ego boundaries, parts then fragment from the subject. And I would say these parts are other conscious selves. So the loosening of ego boundaries of the fundamental mind is something that is fundamental to the hypnagogic state. Uh, Andreas Mavromatis is the leading expert when it comes to hypnagogia, and this is how he clarifies it. The core psychological phenomenon out of which springs the whole gamut of hypnagogic experiences is the loosening of the ego boundaries of the subject. 
I propose that hypnagogia constitutes the dream component of life's triptych, dreaming, sleep, wakefulness, and that, due to its unique character of writing between wakefulness and sleep, facilitates the emergence into consciousness of material that might otherwise remain unconscious. And Mavromatis explains these stages of hypnagogia, and this is what happens after there is a loosening of the uh, ego boundaries. So it starts here when you're relaxing, like when you lay down to go to sleep and you close your eyes as you begin to go deeper into that state where you relax more and more, you begin to see these little flashes of lights and color, similar to what you're seeing in the background of the slide here. And then as you delve deeper into that state, as you let go of the self more and more and you relax and you let go, you begin to see uh, floating, drifting faces and even nature, things like that. And then eventually uh, what you begin to see is a bit more symbolic. They begin to represent other images that you've seen before. And finally, there is this, uh, you see characters with animals and humans and a whole world of experience with sights, colors, and smells, and people that seem to be autonomous. And at least uh, phenomenologically, this is how we see the creation of the dream world. And I think similarly, we can see the creation of the universe in a very similar way. So the hypnagogic state has creativity to form the dream world. I won't read this entire slide. I'll just briefly list the five necessary and sufficient conditions of creativity. Connectedness, originality, non-rationality, self-actualization, and openness are the necessary and sufficient conditions of creativity. But this last one I will focus on a bit. Openness is the opposite of psychological defensiveness. It's characterized by sensitivity, tolerance of ambiguity, self-acceptance, and spontaneity. Finally, these conscious subjects fragment from the fundamental mind and inhabit the dream world. I think this happens through a process uh, known as submergence. There's not a lot of information on it. Um, emergence is something that's very well documented. It's usually seen as this idea of parts coming together to form a whole. But submergence is the converse in which you have a whole that then fragments into these parts. And through a process I call weak submergence, what is intrinsic of the whole is intrinsic of the parts. So another way to phrase that is, as above, so below. Since the whole is conscious, the parts are also conscious. This is a, a topic I will have to make a video about in the future to delve into more details about submergence, but that's basically the process that I think happens when it comes to this creation of other minds. So these parts submerge from the whole. Uh, the consciousness of these subjects are partial and derivative from the fundamental mind. So their cognitive abilities are limited, but they are still conscious. And I think that there's actually evidence of this that we can see of partial fragmented minds within a larger fundamental mind when it comes to dream characters. And uh, dream scientific researchers have actually tested the cognitive abilities of dream characters, and they discovered some surprising results. Uh, in this study right here on the left, Consciousness and abilities of dream characters observed during lucid dreaming. Uh, dream characters were shown to successfully write and draw, to name unknown words, to find rhyme words, and to make verses. However, they did perform poorly on arithmetic problems. The researchers concluded that nothing contradicts them being conscious, and that we should treat them as rational beings in lucid dream therapy. This study was replicated by the one that we can see here on the right. This one focused more so on the mathematical abilities of dream characters, and they found the same results as before. Interestingly enough, dream characters are better with uh, multiplication and division than they are with addition and subtraction. Uh, this study here on the bottom studied the, uh, the creative abilities of dream characters, and it was shown that they are surprisingly creative, and they can even provide plausible creative advice to the dreamer. So, this, I wouldn't say this proves that dream characters are conscious, but they do seem to display these cognitive abilities that are typical of 
those who are conscious. And uh, there are some experienced lucid dreamers who do note that um, they've had some very profound experiences with these uh, characters and that they've even been able to experience what it is like to be a dream character. So um, if there is something it is like to be a dream character, well, then it sounds plausible that, well, then they must be conscious. So why create other conscious selves? Why does this fundamental mind create these distinct selves that are conscious and have their own autonomy and so forth? Uh, before I get too far into that question, I think it's important to note that if we're talking about the creation of an entire universe populated with all these unique individuals, it seems we're going to need a lot of creativity. And if you look at the creative abilities of subjects who are dreaming versus those who are dissociated, there are some differences. Uh, Van Hoyten and her colleagues found that there is only a moderate correlation between dissociation and creativity, and that trait dissociation does not predict creativity. However, as found in the Cambridge Handbook of Creativity and Personality Research, among other uh, scientific researchers who study this topic, openness to experience is the strongest and most consistent personality trait that predicts creativity. Uh, psychologists have identified what are known as the big five personality traits, and openness is one of them, more so than any of these traits. Consistently, openness is the best one for creativity. Uh, the conditions for openness, as Maver Mattis pointed out to us, are found in hypnagogia. And we can even see some evidence of this. Uh, subjects who have narcolepsy, uh, those who experience uh, REM sleep almost immediately, they can fall asleep at any time, and they get lots of sleep and lots of lucid dreams, and they have a lot of hypnagogic hallucinations, and they also score high in measures of creativity. So... When it really does come down to why this creation of other conscious selves occurs, I think there might be some clues in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. At the bottom of the hierarchy are things like food and safety, and at the very top is what Maslow calls self-actualization. Self-actualization is achieving one's full potential, which includes creative activities. Since this mind is fundamental, it has no need for the bottom levels of the pyramid like physiological needs or safety. So I would argue all that really remains for the fundamental mind to do is to self-actualize and to have peak experiences. And a peak experience is an altered state of consciousness and it does lead to euphoria. And remember a characteristic of self-actualization is creativity and openness is the core of the creative personality. So this openness to experience allows for the loosening of ego boundaries, which is an altered and creative state that leads to these peak experiences. Maslow, unlike his predecessors, focused his research on individuals who were healthy. He did several case studies on historical figures and identified several of them as self-actualized. A particular individual that he saw as self-actualized was a transcendentalist known as Henry David Thoreau. While pondering about authenticity, Henry David Thoreau had this to say, Our truest life is when we are in dreams awake. So if you recall earlier, LeBurge defined uh, dreaming as perceiving free. So to perceive freely, to have no limitations and to fully actualize yourself, there does seem to be something to say about how uh, being a lucid dreamer or being a dreamer is a way to really experience what you've been really wanting to experience and open yourself up to new experiences something spontaneous and different schopenhauer agrees that the world does appear to be a dream he writes in uh, the world as will and representation volume two that thus the world must be recognized from one aspect at least as akin to a dream indeed as capable of being put in the same class with the dream for the same brain function that conjures up during sleep a perfectly objective, perceptible, and indeed palpable world must have just as large a share in the presentation of the objective world of wakefulness. Though different as regards their matter, the two worlds are nevertheless obviously molded from one form. 
he has other quotes as well where he talks about how the dreams in our sleep are short dreams and when we're awake that's the long dream so it is noteworthy to also point out that dissociation is usually characterized as a symptom or a disorder while in the context of a dream this splitting off into autonomous entities is a common and healthy phenomenon in conclusion i wouldn't say this fundamental mind is uncomfortable or discontent but rather this fundamental mind is open-minded thank you for watching